Welcome to the RDD RPG podcast. Enter freely and leave some of the happiness you bring. Ah, ah, ah. So, as you might have guessed from my cheesy intro before we did the music, we're going to be talking about vampires in this friend or foe Friday. Now, me and Hannah obviously recognise that vampires are a massive subject. I mean, there's loads of games that are in there. Yeah, this is at least going to be two episodes, and we're almost certainly going to come back to this later in the year. But for starters, we thought we'd look at the very basics of using vampires in RPGs. Yeah, so in this episode, we're going to talk a little bit about vampires as they appear in D&D, a little bit about pop culture, uh, films, books, etc. that involve vampires. Then we're probably going to do another episode where we look at the vampire in other RPGs, maybe talk a little bit about whether you can learn lessons from other RPGs that you can use in D&D, and vice versa. And then, if there's still interest, and we still think we've got things to say on it, we might swing back around and revisit this subject in a future episode. First of all, overview. What's a vampire, really, in RPG terms? So... Obviously, there's lots of different kinds of myths about vampires, all kinds of different stuff. But in RPG terms, if you say vampire, you can expect whatever that system's like signifiers for undead are probably going to, at least in part, apply to this creature. Yeah. And that that creature is going to gain some sort of sustenance, regeneration, power, whatever, from attacking other creatures. Usually blood sucking, but it can be psychic attacks, it can be other stuff in yeah. all different sorts of games. I, I think yeah, I think if you if you sort of drill it down to like brass tacks, it tends to be a creature that was dead and has somehow risen and as you say, somehow like parasitically almost feeds of like the life force, whatever form that takes, of yeah. a, another creature. So while we're on this, I think is a, a good point to take a quick look at the Dictionary of Mythology's definition on vampires. Indeed. Because it's nice and succinct. Yeah, so the Dictionary of Mythology says, A vampire is a monster leaving the grave to suck blood from the living. It also gives it the religious connotations of the spirit of one who has been excommunicated, so like a heretic or something like that. It is said that a vampire can only be killed by driving a stake through its heart or by shooting it with a silver bullet. Also, it defines vampirism as the state of or condition of being a blood-sucking monster or belief in blood-sucking monsters. So there we go. It's basically an undead creature that, in most classic definitions, drinks blood, but as it's been expanded over time, has been expanded to feed off other things like psychic vampirism, as you you were sort of mentioning earlier, love. Let's have a look at what some of the the classic sort of D&D books say of vampires Absolutely. and you were saying earlier of like the picture in the ad and d second edition monster manual of the the sort of like the countess style looking vampire you know with the fur cloak the sort straight of out of dress. a hammer horror movie yeah exactly got that very severe sort of slightly pointed predatory look to her face and we'll probably go on to talk about like universal and hammer and how they did vampires but yeah clearly the AD and D second edition monster manual version of the vampire I, I has been see, taken from that. I can see her having a battle of wits with Vincent Price. Oh yeah, definitely. While his uh, younger sidekick gets seduced by her minions. Indeed. <laughs> okay, so if we look at the stats for the vampire, we can see that it's a fairly tough creature. It has one attack. However, it also has a number of special abilities, which include energy drain so again sucking the life force it can only be hit with plus one or better weapons and i believe it has some other abilities yeah spider climb uh, can summon lesser creatures for aid so swarms of bats rats etc can charm people um, but also it has the classic weaknesses of a vampire so aversion to garlic holy symbols etc And it also has the classic inability to enter a home without first being invited to do so by a person who lives there. And the book 
very carefully defines that this does not apply to public buildings and places of business since by their very nature they are inviting people to enter the building a common manner for obtaining permission to enter a home the book says is for the vampire to use its gaze to charm uh, a servant or another inhabitant of the building and thus gain entry that way it goes on to say that any human or humanoid creature slain by the life energy drain of the vampire so that has its blood sucked out by the vampire is doomed to become a vampire themselves thus those who would hunt these lords of the undead must be very careful lest they find themselves condemned to a fate far worse than death we've got a few classic abilities there that anyone who knows you sort of hammer horror universal vampire will recognize they've got this hypnotic mesmerism they can use on people they can change into a wolf or a bat or sometimes a mist they can they can cause others to rise as from the dead as vampires and various other bits and pieces that we'll all be familiar with also the the spider climbing so climbing up walls etc is a bit of a thing but they're balanced out by several weaknesses so holy symbols garlic not being invited into a home stake through the heart things like that let's have a look at what they've done with that in fifth edition the most recent version of D, &D mm -hmm. as of time of recording so this time you've got more pages on vampires you get a pretty big spread for you do. vampires don't you first page is basic setup for the vampire and how one might occur yeah so and includes a block out for player characters as vampires yeah and now obviously anyone who knows the the sort of white wolf uh, vampire system will no doubt want to hear about that we're not going to deal with that in very much detail in these couple of episodes because that's a whole game system where vampires are the protagonists and we need to do a bit more of a deep dive into that we'll but, come back round to it if it's in demand yeah if people are Let interested if people are interested we'll, we'll get around to looking at like, the white wolf vampires but it's interesting to see that as hannah said in dnd fifth edition there's a little box out describing just giving you a few little ideas of what you uh, could do and this is before you even get to the blocks this is like two pages earlier where you get the player characters as vampires info. Indeed. Which so. is just like a couple of paragraphs. But if you want to go that route, it's there for you ready in the monster book. So obviously between the old AD&D 2nd edition monster manual and the 5th edition monster manual, there's been a bit of a shift from regarding vampires as purely antagonists, monsters to be defeated, evil creatures, to being potential player characters, which I'm sure does have something to do with the White Wolf games. Also vampires being treated a bit more sympathetically in films and books you know Anne Rice and, uh, like I expect it has a lot more to do with Anne Rice and Joss Whedon <laughs> okay and if we look at the picture in the fifth edition book I believe that's depicting Strahd von Zorovich who is the main vampire character from the Ravenloft campaign and there is a little write-up about him and he's most definitely based on the sort of old Opry style of vampire, you know, the, the sort of enigmatic nobleman who's cursed for his sins and now sort of seeks revenge, etc. Uh, then we've got another little box out about vampires' layers and regional effects on them. So there's an increase in the population of bats, rats and wolves. Plants around there start to wither shadows seem spookier there's a spooky fog for 500 feet around the lair and if the vampire is destroyed these effects end after 2d6 days that's a nice little touch that, that's quite cool and i do like the whole like layers thing they've done in fifth edition although it does make me it does make me wonder because quite often maybe not so much in dnd but quite often with like the vampire story like people don't realize there's a vampire there until too mm. late it does make me wonder how like if a vampire like lairs in a place all this like spooky shizzle starts going on that people aren't like oh does anyone does anyone notice like it's got a bit foggy in the old village all of a sudden there's a lot of wolves around i think you have to assume that this sort of thing happens over time yeah. like there's not magically a hundred new rats you have to wait for a hundred new rats to be born I, I think stuff like that i think whilst i think whilst it's maybe not appropriate for every campaign i think for a, like a ravenloft campaign where it's in this nightmarish demi plane where everything's already pretty pretty horrific maybe like you wouldn't notice like there's been an increase in rats or whatever i think 
I think, like you say, you'd have to treat that with a little bit of subtlety, otherwise it'd just be like obvious. Mm. So as soon as you're like, oh, there's a load of bats and wolves around, and oh, there's a spooky mist, a- anyone who's seen a film will be like, oh, vampires. <laughs> that that would certainly I, be my response. I, I think if you're going to put vampires in your game, you may as well just accept that the players are going to notice all of that stuff immediately and roll with it well, or pick some really obscure vampires that's just how it goes if you if you see if you see a bent old woman with a crooked nose which you see mist and wolves vampires that's just how it goes so then we finally get to the actual vampire stat block it's got a whole page hasn't which it? again is nice and neatly arranged for fifth edition compared mm. to the second ed I've got to hand it to them the layout is better yeah I mean we've said before uh, that um, in the in the older books you the information is just spread out in big wadges of text and it's all over the place. You have to really sort of delve for it, whereas it's nicely sort of almost bullet-pointed in this, isn't mm-hmm. it, like the titles in bold. So, again, powers. We've got shape change power. Uh, we've got uh, improved saving throws. We've got misty escape. We've got a regen power, spider climb, vampire weaknesses to they can't enter a residence without invitation. They're harmed by running water as if it was acid. State to the heart sunlight hypersensitivity I mean, i'm sure there's one of the old um the old hammer horror films like christopher lee like one of the dracula films where like at the end they they manage to like hold like a cross up to like keep him there and he gets immersed in running water and that's how it, it sort of like dissolves him almost mm-hmm. so i wonder whether they've been influenced by that it's particularly the mention of it as like acid damage i was specifically thinking of well i know it's a whole like, well, legend well, I know, thing I know they there's... can't cross a stream yeah, yeah, but and I, I, I know they can't cross a stream, but it's specifically the fact that, like, if you end your turn, it like it dissolves your like acid. That made me think, oh, mm-hmm. maybe they've been influenced by that. I, I don't know. I'm just speculating. It's kind of interesting that they haven't added, or oh, maybe they have, and I haven't spotted it yet. The uh, vulnerability to attacks by priests. No, I believe that's just comes under the standard undead turning rules, so it's not actually. Ah, uh, right, I see. Well, I see they've added like sunlight sensitivity you take 20 radiant damage whenever you start turning sunlight mm-hmm. that's nothing to be sneezed at so yes yeah, so they've got a bite attack um they do piercing damage plus necrotic damage and the target's hit point maximum is reduced by an amount equal to the necrotic damage so as well as actually taking hit points off someone you're lowering down the maximum hit points they can have as you're like draining their life away and if you die whilst you're under that, you come back as a vampire spawn, which is like a sort of weaker version mm-hmm. of a vampire that's controlled by the master vampire. And that, again, has got a page in the book, but I think if we start looking at vampire spawn, we're going to be here all day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If, if, so, essentially, all you need to know is they're the minion vampires. You know, you, you've seen it in, like, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. There's one, like, big-ass, powerful master vampire who's got, well, well, maybe not so much in Buffy, but they've got, like, the intelligence... And then there's the then there's the dumb thug vampires who she fights at the start and like kills with the greatest yeah, of these. There's the master, and then there's his minions. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, granted, a lot of other a lot of other stories and films didn't go to quite the extent of Buffy and be, of being obvious and just calling him the master. But got to give them props for like wearing their heart on their sleeve. They they just put it out there. And the thing is, I know there's always been sort of like vampires in fiction where they they create another vampire and who serves them Mm -hmm. but i think certainly recently that that well over the last few years that distinction between like the master vampire and like the shitty little minion vampires has become like more sort of distinct because so i I know in the old hammer horror films you had like dracula and his brides i think the reason for that is that it's become a lot easier to do gory vampire death yeah, special true. effects. You think about the first film where you get like a lot of minions getting killed off, mm. and it's like early Hammer horror films where you're getting like the brides of Dracula killed off before him, yeah. so that they can do a few like dust effects and things. And then think to like Lost Boys. The actual main vampire getting killed off. That's like three seconds of screen time. Yeah, that's true. The rest of the group is about 60 percent of the movie yeah, yeah. true <laughs> and, and then true. buffy she's got to like kill off a random spod vampire in an alley every week while she's on her way to do something else yeah because she's a vampire slayer okay so we're getting a bit off topic here as you can tell <laughs> we've both watched a lot of vampire <laughs> films and read a lot of vampire fiction so um you forgive us if we're rambling a bit but well, we, um, we were gonna 
I was going to say, I, I think... Other vampire myths and legends. Oh, yeah, of course. But I was going to say, before we get on to that, I think in D&D, the, the vampire is like the classic sort of archetypal version of what I like to call like a, a puzzle monster. It's mm. that monster where like if you don't study it and you don't know its weaknesses, it's just going to like annihilate you. However, if you, if you like do a bit of research and you find out about those weaknesses, you can turn them against the creature... So it's a monster that rewards someone who's willing to like put a bit of that background research in if you've maybe got like a bard or something like that who can find out those legends. I mean, obviously we all know about a character, but... Now, do I remember that in, I think it's Forgotten Realms, the different like species when they're made into vampires have different weaknesses. So like the elf ones are damaged by gold... Yeah, um, so I, I don't recall the exact details of that, but I do seem to remember that's... I've got a feeling that the halfling ones were damaged by tobacco smoke in the same way that others were by garlic. That does sound familiar, yeah, <laughs> and, and it'd be an interesting sort of wrinkle on a character. And obviously, as much as I say that a vampire is like an archetypal puzzle monster out of character, we all know what the main weaknesses of a vampire are. But the, there's a lot of different stuff you can do them, like Hannah said, varying the weaknesses. I'm just having a quick flick through my Sword and Sorcery Ravenloft monster book here, and they've split they've split them out into different types of vampires, you were saying, love, mm-hmm. by race. So we've got, like, a dwarven vampire here, uh, which can cause terror with its gaze. It can merge with stone. It heals quickly. Uh, it, it has tremor sense, stuff like that. Uh, we've got an elven vampire who like poisons all natural things around them. They they drain charisma and they just like plant life just like dies around them because they've become like the opposite of what they were in life. We've got a gnomish vampire and basically every race you can want. And then there's a few other variants like there's the Chang Shi, which is like your sort of hopping vampires of the Eastern mm-hmm. vampire stereotype. We've got the we've got the vampire Y R E, which is a I suppose more of a sort of a ghoulish thing. And then we've got a Vorlog, which is when a vampire chooses a new companion, it must pour its blood and passion into the transformation, then lie helpless beside them while they transform. If the vampire is slain between this period, the campaign becomes sorry, the companion becomes a pitiable thing trapped between the worlds of the living or the dead. So obviously the Ravenloft, which is more of a horror setting, has gone into more sort of detail. Yeah, you'd, you'd kind of expect Ravenloft to have quite a section on vampires. Yeah, and I mean Ravenloft tries to push that more of that sort of horror vibe with uh, with D and D, and obviously that spun out from the sort of Castle Ravenloft module, which was where Strad von Zorovich first appeared, and it sort of like the whole of like Ravenloft really spun off from that module, which is pretty much. You're going to Dracula's castle is <laughs> pretty much the module, to be honest. So, one of the things about vampires, yeah, if you're going to put them in your game, they kind of need to be like an interesting villain to make yes, them worth yes. putting into your game. And obviously, like a lot of people take some influence from good villains they've seen in other stuff. So, what vampires would you use as like a role model for one of your villains in one of your games? What, well, from fiction. Well, I mean, if we look at one of the earliest, um, earliest vampire stories, which was John Polidori's *The Vampire*, mm. it it was, I think it was eighteenth, seventeenth century, I forget, but it was one of the first to show them as like aristocratic. Mm-hmm. You know, before then they'd just been these sort of like savage ghouls that rose from the dead and ate the dead and whatever, coming from sort of like Eastern Yugoslavia and stuff mm-hmm. like that. But um, Polidori's *The Vampire* sort of. He based them very loosely on Lord Byron. You know, the very suave, very debonair, you know, very sort of magnetic personality. So I think what I'd probably do is, if I was looking to play like a vampire as like an NPC or a monster, I'd probably try and find, like, I don't know, maybe like an actor or, uh, I don't know, maybe like a public speaker. Someone who I thought had a, had an ability to influence a lot of people or had a very like, forceful personality. And I'd sort of, I'd keep them in my mind while I was trying to sort of do the, portray the vampire. Because I think, and that's one of the, the things about them, is they're not, they don't just run in and go, oh, I'm a vampire, I'm here to treat your blood and not kill you. Mm-hmm. They, they're these very sort of Machiavellian, typically sort of villains who have these great plans and great schemes that they've taken hundreds of years to put in place because they've got all of eternity effectively 
So, yeah, I mean, say so like I suppose like your Oscar Wilde's, your like say your, your Lord Byron's, people like that. How about yourself? If you were running a vampire, would you base it on? Well, I don't think I'd go into quite as much historical detail as that. What I quite like to do is find Google pictures of various actors to use oh, okay. for NPCs in my game because I'm not a particularly good actor. I'm not particularly good at voices and stuff. I often struggle even to keep up with the dialogue as I'm trying to do it. No, I mean, so I'm being able it. to say, oh, imagine Peter Dinklage was doing this character. Imagine Carrie Fisher's doing this character. Uh Ron Perlman's quite a popular NPC in my current game. I was going to say, I, <laughs> I also use like Google Image Search and stuff like that to find like pictures for NPCs. One of the things I found, because obviously I've just started up a Vampire the Masquerade game, and I was looking for vampire pictures, one of the slight problems is, because like vampires are so popular now, is that if you just go into Google and type in like vampire picture, you will get like a million and one pictures of people like cosplaying vampires, and some of them are very good, but a lot of them don't really work for NPCs in RPGs. Whereas you could have just thought of an actor you liked, stuck it in Photoshop and done that little blur effect I, I, on the teeth could, if you felt the need. I could have done, but I don't really <laughs> like to use like famous actors because then like that gives certain expectations. So like if like if I this is an I, entirely different conversation that we should have in an entirely different episode, you know. Indeed. Um, so we're so, with a twirl of my cape. <laughs> we'll go back to the subject. So one <sighs> other thing that I was thinking about when we first started talking about vampires is that I vaguely remember, like in high school, hearing that there was a local legend from like the early medieval period about St. Modwin, who's the saint of our town. Yeah. And, like, vampires, like, in our local town. And I'm fairly sure you've been able to Google it. Oh, I have indeed. I wondered if you wanted to end the episode by telling the story of our local vampires. OK, so I'm not going to go through the whole thing because it's a, a bit lengthy, but I'm just going to give you the, the quick rundown of it. And this is uh, from a, a website that I found this on. And it's about the vampires of Draco, circa 1090. And it comes from an account of the life and miracles of St. Modwenna, a mysterious saint whose bones were kept at Burton Abbey, founded 1008. Okay, so two villagers living in the small village of Statenall under the jurisdiction of the abbot of Burton. They ran away to a neighbouring village called Draco, wrongly leaving their lords, the monks, etc., the father of the monastery ordered that their crops and all their um, possessions should be seized and taken to his own barn, hoping to like lure them back in. So th the men went off. They lied about what had happened. They brought troublesome charges and problems to the doors of the count of the area. Basically, they, they pinned the blame for everything that had gone wrong on the abbot. So much so that this count threatened to kill the abbot. Eventually... The Count gathered up a great troop of knights, peasants, etc., weapons and cart, rampaged down to the monk's barn at Stapenhill, grabbed all the crops, loads of stuff belonging to the abbey, as well as the stuff belonging to the fugitives. The very next day, the two runaway peasants were sitting down to eat when, by divine providence, they were both suddenly struck down dead. They were placed in wooden coffins and buried in the churchyard. However, the very same day upon which they were buried, they appeared in the evening, while the sun was still up at Draco, carrying on their shoulders the very coffins in which they had been buried. Dun, 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 dun. Dun. The following night, they walked through the paths and fields of the village, now in the shape of men carrying wooden coffins on their shoulders, sometimes in the likeness of bears, dogs, other animals, stuff like that. They spoke to all the peasants, banging on the walls of the houses, and shouting, Move quickly! Move! Get going! Come! And when these events had taken place for some time, uh, a disease or a malady began to afflict the village. The Count was terrified. He repented, came with his knights to the monastery where he basically said, Oh, look, I'm really sorry. I was an absolute dick to you. Could you please help me out with this problem? He gave a command to Drogo, his reaver, his second, so that there should be double restitution for all the damage he inflicted on the monastery. So he was then like, right, job done. Left the monastery, went to his other lands. Drogo quickly returned, 
gave double monies back to the Abbey, and after seeking pardon, he too left as well, because he was like, I don't fancy any of this disease, I'm getting out. Some people, greatly afraid of the already mentioned dead men who had been walking through the village, carrying their coffins on the shoulder every evening and night, received permission from the bishop to go to their graves and dig them up. They not only found them intact, but the linen cloths over their faces were stained with blood. Indeed. They cut off their head and placed them in the grave between their legs, tore out the hearts from the corpses and covered the bodies with earth again. They brought the hearts to a place called Dode Cross Fora and there burned them from morning until evening. Whereas if greatly compelled, they had at last been burned up. They cracked with a great sound and everyone visibly saw the evil spirit in the form of a crow fly up from the flames. As soon as this was done, the disease and the haunting ceased. Local peasants who were sick in the bed recovered their health as soon as they saw the smoke rising. They got up, gathered their children and wives and all of their possession, and giving thanks to God and the Holy Virgin, they had escaped. They left very hastily. Draclo was thus abandoned, and for a long time thereafter, no one dared live there, fearing the vengeance that had struck there, and wondering at the prodigies that God had worked through the Holy Virgin. And that is the story, albeit in a brief but slightly mm -hmm. rambling mm -hmm. form, of the Draco vampires. And um, we're getting on a bit now, so I think we'll wrap up this episode, love, yeah. and then we'll come in our next Friend of Foe Friday episode. We're going to talk a little bit more about how vampires are treated in popular culture, films, books, also how they're treated in other RPGs, and how you can maybe take inspiration from those RPGs. Even if you're not running them, you, know, you can mix mm -hmm. and match things a little bit. But we hope to see you then. If you've enjoyed this episode, you can leave us a voicemail message on SpeakPipe or you can get in touch with us via email. The address is rddrpgpodcast at gmail.com. We really do enjoy listening to and answering your calls. Until we see you next time, take care, stay well and keep gaming. See you later. Bye. Okay, we'll just take Actually, I'm going to drag this. <laughs> Good job I'm not a halfling vampire, innit? Drag on this one. <laughs> Keeping yeah. halfling vampires away. <laughs>